Our speaker today is Linda Ketchum, Executive Director of the Madison Area Urban Ministry, who will talk about reducing recidivism in our community. Linda holds a bachelor's degree in corrections and a master's degree in criminal justice sciences from Illinois State University. She has over 35 years of experience in human services, including work with children of incarcerated parents, survivors of domestic violence, incarcerated parents, and individuals returning to the community from prison. We look forward to Linda's presentation and we have made a contribution to the Rotary International Polio Plus Fund as a way of saying thanks for speaking to us today. As we welcome her to the podium, I want to remind you that if time permits, that we will have questions at the end and microphones would be circulating for those questions. So please give a warm welcome to Linda Ketchum. Suddenly I feel old. 35 years, that's a long time. But I want to thank you for inviting me to join you today. It really is an honor to be here with a group of community members who have been so invested in improving our community through your good works, through your past support of some of our programs in Madison Area Urban Ministry, including our Mentoring Connections program for kids who have an incarcerated parent and our most recent project, Healing House. I also want to say in preparation for speaking with you today, I, I watched the video that was embedded in, in my email correspondence back and forth with Jane on your uh, history. And Renee was right. Um, the music was just awesome. So <laughs> I, I really, I, I want to thank you for that. It's, I would say it's better than church, but my minister is here. And so <laughs> I will not go that far. So I do want to talk a little bit uh, about Madison Area Urban Ministry as an organization, uh, because Nasra, who is our development director, told me I must. Uh, we have been around for 43 years as an interfaith social justice organization. We have worked over the years to incubate and spin off nonprofits in our community that responded to emerging needs. Programs like Project Home, most of the Madison senior coalitions in our city. We founded uh, a group called Transitional Housing that worked with Grace Episcopal and other faith communities to open the first men's shelter at Grace Episcopal in 1985. That group merged with CHAZ to form Porchlight, and I know Steve Schooler was here. I don't know if Steve's still here. So we have a long history in our community of engaging in looking at issues and studying issues, and really, in a, in a sense, kind of asking. We try to bring people to the table to respond to those emerging needs, to who makes sense to be part of this conversation. As Rachel said, bringing all the voices to the table, and that means the people who are affected by those issues as well, not just those of us who think we know what we're doing. So we bring people to the table and we look at these issues and we study these issues through a task force. And if there is no other organization willing to take on the issue, we then ask ourselves, if not us, who? And if not now, when? And we go through a discernment process to decide if we will be the organization to take some of those projects on. In the 1990s, our Justice Issue Task Force started to look at incarceration. We started to look at what happens when people come home. Because 90%, well over 90% of the people we send to prison come home and they are our neighbors. What kind of neighbors do we want them to be? And what kind of neighbors are we willing to be? So we began to study the criminal justice system. And we found a system that was flawed a system that focused on incarceration with little concern for what happened when someone came back from prison. We found a system that vastly over-incarcerates people of color with huge disparities. We found that all of the issues we as an organization had traditionally cared about, racism, poverty, affordable housing, homelessness, and access to education, they all converged when we looked at who we send to prison and what their needs are oftentimes when they come home from prison. Those findings led us to develop and implement a number of programs beginning in 1999 with our returning prisoner simulation, which is a group activity that is designed to help people understand what it's like those first 30 days out of prison. We started our Mentoring Connections program to work with kids who have an incarcerated parent because children are the collateral damage of our criminal justice system. 
We started family and reading connections, taking kids to visit their moms at Tachita. We started circles of support, which I want to give a shout out to the Honorable Judge Mitchell over there, who was our first program, uh, program coordinator for circles of support, that matches volunteers with someone newly released from prison as a new network of support and community and reinforcement for the changes they're making in their life. We also started our Just Bakery program, a vocational training program that is part of the United Way's Hire Initiative, offering 16 weeks of training for people interested in commercial baking and who have chronic barriers to employment. And then, of course, the Journey Home program, which is our main focus, or my main focus today. So just try to wrap your head around this issue, this, this number, if you can. 1,750 people, 1,750. That is the number of people in the United States who are released from prison every day. Every day, 1,750 people. That's what happens when you incarcerate 2.2 million people in a country. Nationally, 67.8% of people released from state prisons are rearrested within five years and nearly half of them go back to prison. It's a huge drain on our communities in terms of human capital, and it's a huge drain on our pocketbooks. In 2014, the United States spent an estimated $80 billion on incarceration. Is that where we want to invest our money? Each year, well, as, as we're gathered here today, just to give a scope, even in Dane County and the state of Wisconsin, as we're gathered here right now, there are 22,526 men and women in prison in Wisconsin. Just in our state prisons, that doesn't count county jails and it doesn't count federal prison. 934 of them are incarcerated in the three prisons found in Dane County. Another 2,500 people or so cycle through the Dane County Jail on an annual basis Many of them have served up to 18 months in jail, which is really the equivalent of a prison sentence. Every year, 600 to 900 people return to Dane County from prison. And over the years, I've worked with hundreds of individuals who are involved with the criminal justice system. And several years ago, I spoke with a woman who described her release from prison to me using the language of her Christian faith tradition. She said, the moment they opened the prison gate, it felt like they had rolled away the stone from the tomb. I emerged from the prison gate, a sort of death that I had been living, into a rebirth, into a new life filled with possibilities and filled with opportunities. But I also knew it was a new life filled with barriers, filled with judgments, and filled with doubting Thomases who were just waiting for my transformation to be disproved. Her description is pretty apt for what happens to the men and women when they return from prison. Incarceration is intended to be the consequence for having violated a law, but too often when someone leaves the prison, the punishment goes on and on and on. There's been a significant body of research since the 1990s that's been conducted by criminologists and sociologists. The research has identified, now some people think because we're Madison Area Urban Ministry, we're faith-based, this kind of we're well-intentioned church people and we don't pay attention to science, but we actually read research. So there's this whole body of literature from the 1990s through the present day that has tracked and looked at what works when we are offering programs and working with people returning from prison. So one of the things I was most nervous about today is I've never used PowerPoint before. So we'll see how this goes. When I speak at churches, nobody really wants data or a PowerPoint. So on the screen are the principles that have been identified through research as the strategies that are most effective in helping reduce the number of individuals who return to prison. And I wanted to show them to you and talk just a little bit about them because I think it's important when we start to talk about the journey home to understand 
that there is research and there is literature that supports what we're doing. This is the framework that the United Way used. This is why we do what we do through the journey home and why we do it the way we do it. So starting at the bottom, you assess the risk. You use a validated risk assessment tool. The Department of Corrections in Wisconsin uses the compass. What you are looking at is the likelihood that someone will commit a new crime. That's what your risk assessment in Wisconsin called the compass is evaluating. How likely is this person, given a number of variables that they're looking at, how likely are they to commit a new crime? You want to focus your interventions and your energy on people who are, are assessed at medium to high level of reoffending. In fact, the research now tells us that for many years we did it absolutely wrong. We kind of picked the low hanging fruit. We said, oh look, this person has job skills, they have a house to go to, you know, they, they just made this, this one mistake and you know, they're not gonna, they're not gonna do this again. Let's, let's really surround them with all sorts of services. And what the research has now told us is that when we focus our interventions on people who are assessed at a low risk of reoffending, we increase the likelihood that they will reoffend. They don't need us. We just muck up their life. That's, that's, I think if you ask them, they might use a different term, but uh, it might rhyme. So, so you, we assess the risk, and then we look at the need, and we're looking at their needs, the changeable, er, the changeable areas in their life, addiction, communication skills, peer groups, we're looking at what their needs are, and we're starting to build intervention, and we're looking at their risk level, and we're building interventions that address those needs and that risk level. Enhancing their intrinsic motivation, it makes sense, right? What, how many of you are, are former smokers? So did you know somebody else who quit way before you? Because they, they figured out what motivated them to quit? Was it the same thing that motivated you? We're each individuals. What motivates me to change is not the same as what motivates Jeff to change. So we're looking for the intrinsic, you know, how, are, how does this person respond? What things motivate them? And that's what we need to be focusing on. Targeting the interventions. Again, we're looking for people who are medium to high risk, who have these needs. We're looking at their needs. We're putting programming in place that is responsive to those needs, and it's responsive not just in terms of addressing the issue, but what are their learning styles? What is their develop where are they developmentally? Where are they in terms of readiness to change? What might be their trauma history? What might be, you know, what are the cultural or, or, or other factors that for this person it's important we find the right program provider because we're also, we're not just matching the, the program, we're matching the right provider for that person as well. Skill train with directed practice. So that's really a cognitive behavioral approach. We're teaching people skills, we're practicing over and over and over, we're offering them opportunities to practice. Increasing positive reinforcement. The research tells us in corrections and if you've ever watched, you know, some of the law and order shows and stuff, you'll know this doesn't, you don't see this on TV. We're supposed to have a ratio of four to one positive reinforcements to sanctions. This can be positive praise. This can be, in our case at the journey home, when someone gets a new job, a 31 day bus pass. Great. Now you don't have to worry about your transportation. You know, it might be a gift card. In circles of support, it's a celebration dinner with their circle members when they're done. So increasing positive reinforcement. And then engaging in ongoing support in the community. This might be a faith community. This might be a series of support groups. This might be a club, a book club. It could be an athletic team. But you're looking for ways to connect people so they have ongoing support long term in their communities and in their communities, their natural communities. And then on the sides, we want to make sure that we're also doing our, our due diligence with the programming and we want to measure what we're doing. 
We want to have outcome measurements. We want to look at how successful it is. And we want to have a measurement feedback loop so that we continue to have a process of quality, continued quality improvement or whatever you want to call it. But we want to make sure that we understand what we're doing, what works, what's not working, and how do we make it better. So that's why we do what we do. Isn't that exciting? So it was, it was these eight principles in mind. It was with these principles in mind and after examining other reentry programs that in 2006 the United Way launched the Journey Home Initiative with the goal of reducing the number of people who returned to prison in Dane County from 66% to, <laughs> no, it wasn't zero. We're not, we're not silly. Um, but it was, I think, I'm blanking on them, or 45%. Thank you, Angela. Um, so we wanted to, we had 66, so 66% of the people, almost seven out of 10 went back to prison within two years. We wanted to bring that down. So we wanted to bring it down to 45%. By 2012, well, we had succeeded in that, but I'll, I've jumped ahead of myself now, which sometimes happens. So the journey home, Madison Area Urban Ministry was selected to, to implement the journey home working with the United Way. So we're looking at connecting people with at least three of the strategies in the journey home, residency, employment, support, and treatment, or as we call it, rest. We also connect people with education and transportation because those are, are other components that help them access those other four areas. So we focus on addressing the myriad of barriers that people face when they return to the community from prison. Our programming begins with an assessment we're making sure that they are, have been assessed by corrections as medium to high risk. We're working on, a, we're doing a needs assessment. What are the needs? What kind of programming? What kind of programming is gonna meet those needs? We're working with people, we're asking them, what are your goals? What do you want to accomplish? Because again, I don't know. I don't know what Nasra wants to achieve in her life unless I ask her. And some of our participants have never actually ever been asked what they want or what their goals are. And so, in some ways, it's, it's a positive reinforcement for them to have someone respect them enough to say, what is it you want to do? Tell, tell me what your goals are. Because if we can help you achieve them, that's great. Or if there's somebody else who can better help you achieve them, then let's connect you with them. So we do the needs assessment, we set goals, we target our interventions based on the risk and need, we refer people out to mental health and drug treatment programs, employment programs, job skills training, and housing services. And all of this with the idea that for the men and women we're working with, we want to structure 40 to 70% of their time for the first three to nine months out of prison. We want to keep them busy. We want to keep them connected with positive supports in the community. They said it was okay if I told stories, so. Illumaday walked out of prison on the Tuesday before Thanksgiving in 2008. He had been in for about 18 years on a violent offense. And you got to think about it, when you get out of prison on the Tuesday afternoon before Thanksgiving, everything's going to shut down the day after tomorrow for four days. He was homeless. He had no work history to speak of. He had no supports in the community, because one of the things that happens in Wisconsin, we have a policy, you are returned to the community in which you were convicted. That doesn't mean that's the community you've ever lived in. There's, a, there's an old saying, um, when you're from Illinois, and particularly when you might be from the Chicago area, and particularly when you are black, Wisconsin. Come on vacation, leave on probation. We have a lot of men and women who come to our community, and, and it's, not, it's not necessarily Illinois, it's actually more people who come to our community now from other Wisconsin communities that don't have the resources we have in Dane County who find their way here. But, so you come back sometimes to a community you've never lived in, and that was Illumide's case, and he didn't know what to do with his time. We were able to connect him with Porchlight. He got into the shelter, we got him, enrolled in our employability classes. But he really, 
I mean, he didn't know what to do with himself after all that time. So he, he asked us, he said, can I just hang out here? I'll, I'll, I'll clean for you. I'll, whatever you want me to do. So for the first two months he was out of prison, Illumide pretty much spent about 20 hours a week just hanging out in our office. Doing, he'd sort our little food pantry and throw away the food that was expired. He'd, he was structuring his own time. But that's sometimes how that looks. You may have somebody who comes into you and wants to volunteer, and that's part of what they're doing. So Illumide eventually, um, well, it's funny, st funny story maybe. Um, you know, one of the things that happened on, on, on January, I think it was the 19th of 2009, came in the office that morning and asked us if we might try to set up our TV so that he could watch Barack Obama's inauguration. And Illumide, in his 40s, had never voted before because he'd been on supervision his entire adult life, so had lost that right in Wisconsin. And I watched him sitting there as he watched the inauguration, and something lit up in him. It was like this moment of insight that here was, this, here was this voice he could have as well that he had so far been denied. So Lumide is still in the community. He does, he's doing well. He pops in every once in a while, part of our ongoing support. And the funny thing to me was he popped in on election day of 2012. Because in fact, he did so well he got off of supervision early. And he popped in to tell us that he had just voted for the first time in his life. And that was a celebration. That was a positive reinforcement. So it doesn't always look like what we think it's going to look like. And that's why we have to ask. So most of the men and women that we work with are homeless. And they're homeless when they walk out of the prison gate because we don't have enough affordable housing, because some of them have bad credit, because some of them have no credit, because some of them have a history of eviction. So our Dream Home Resource Specialists work with them to help them get housing that may include teaching money management skills, budgeting, helping them figure out what they can afford, help, helping them brainstorm to see if there is somebody they could share an apartment with. And if there is, then we have to make sure that we ask their parole agent because when you are on supervision, you must get permission from your parole agent before you sign a lease, before you accept a job, before you get a driver's license, before you buy a car, how many of us would want to live with those rules? Sometimes for 10, 12, 15 years after you get out of the prison. So we also provide information on their rights and responsibilities as tenants and the rights and responsibilities of landlords. We connect them with other housing providers. We have a great relationship with the Apartment Association of South Central Wisconsin. They've helped us, helped open some doors to, to landlords. So, Jeffrey was somebody who was released in 2014 from prison, and, and he enrolled in the Journey Home. How am I doing on time? Oh, I got to go fast. So, so we were able to help him get an apartment in part because he had, he had no credit history. He had no rental history. So we, signed, we, we found someone to co-sign his lease. Now, his mom was willing to co-sign his lease. And I will say, Jeffrey is black. His mom was willing to co-sign the lease, but the landlord said her 750 credit score wasn't high enough. So we asked a lawyer that we know, who's a supporter of our program, if he would be willing to co-sign the lease. And he said he would. So the landlord said he would accept that, and he co-signed the lease. And I guess it never occurred to him that this attorney whose credit score was basically the same as Jeffrey's mom's might also be black. We have a microloan program that we've set up and our participants can access and build a, a credit history with us through that loan program. I need to show this video if I've only got three minutes. <laughs> so I'm jumping ahead. I'm jumping way ahead. So we can go to the, yep. I am the body shop manager at the 1601 location, Fish Hatchery Road. Uh, we, we repair vehicles, body repairs, collision repairs. Uh, we fix. 40 to 50 cars a week here. I like working for Zimbrick's because our uh, company is family owned. It's the Zimbrick family. Tom Zimbrick is the CEO and president of the company. We have a lot of employees and we all get along. And um, one of our core values is, you know, we treat the customers with respect 
and things like that. And it's our, uh, another core value is continuous improvement. Uh, be it on the job or in our personal lives, we have to improve every day. I enjoy the summertime, I'm a summer person. Um, I like warm weather, I'm very good at that. I, I like to water ski, I'm a coin collector, um, I golf. I love hockey, I like sports, football. In high school I played a lot of sports. Uh, and then I got in trouble, you know, with the law. Spent over 30 years in prison. Anytime you hear that, a little apprehensive to some extent. Uh, however, um, uh, regardless of what his past was, we had a, a position to fill, and Troy fit that position. I've been working at Zimbrix now for seven months. I guess we all, somewhere along the line, need second chance. People change, you know, and I believe that uh, forgiveness is a starting point. We brought him in. We interviewed him quickly uh, and uh, we hired him within a few days. But the thing about it is they asked about were you ever convicted of a crime or felony and, and you know that was the hardest question for me to answer but I had to be honest. We had an opportunity he was hired to just clean cars, vacuum wash and things like that and he did a very fine job doing that uh, and we had an opportunity one of the uh, one of our other employees left for other employment somewhere and he was doing such a wonderful job that uh, we thought that he would fit doing wet sanding and buffing is kind of a paint process. So he fit right in. We brought somebody in to train him. He worked with him for three, four, possibly four days, I think. And uh, from there, he's just been taking off and learning the job very well. There's room for promotion in the company. There's room for promotion as an individual. It is, it's basically as far as you want to go here, you know. Whatever you show your interest in, then that's the direction you might want to take. Um, we do have high hopes for Troy, I mean that it's the entry level into being a prepper, painter, and things like that. So, uh, and if he chooses to advance his, himself, we'll, we'll give him the opportunity. Now, now on my free time, what I do is I go to meetings and things like that. I do a lot with the church. Uh, I play the piano in the church, uh, on the worship team and things like that. Troy is a really a fun guy to work with. He's got a great sense of humor. Uh, the guys enjoyed him being around, uh, and we kind of, him and I are kind of become friends, you know, and we talk daily and as a group, and we have a group meeting every morning. Troy participates in that and uh, gets his assignments for the day, and then off to work he goes. People do uh, realize that they've done wrong. You know, and they and they want to better themselves. You know, and and they're sick and tired of uh, doing the same thing over and over again and getting the same results. I mean, that's insanity. Um, I believe that uh, a person needs a second chance. I believe that a person uh, can do better with a second chance. It just takes hard work, you know, and self motivation to continue on, even when the doors get shut in your face. Uh, you have to have, you know, you have to keep moving ahead. You know, it's challenging, but they're out there. That's why I'm so grateful for Madison Urban Ministry because they gave me a second chance. You know, they didn't shut the door in my face. Troy's a really good example of what can happen when someone goes through some of the, the training, the employability skills, but then when an employer offers an opportunity for someone, opens those doors. So, and you, you heard him describe some of the things that he does with his free time. Again, it's that ongoing support in the community that he's found and put around him. Those are some of the things through the journey home with support that we try to connect people with. We have a support group called the Phoenix Initiative that's facilitated by our staff who are formerly incarcerated. Um, individuals can go to that. We also have an AODA counselor on staff and a certified peer support recovery specialist. So we have some multidisciplinary folks on, on the team. So as people are waiting, there are waiting lists sometimes for treatment and uh, support. 
groups and we can help them stay engaged with services. So I'm going to put these slides up really quick and you can look at them. We also have a service fair which is a monthly one-stop shop through the journey home and people can come and talk with lots of different vendors. In September it was an employment fair. We had employers there providing information, taking applications. So that's the journey home. I mean, using evidence-based practices to support prison reentry. Remember I said the goal was to, you can see here kind of how many people we've, we've actually worked with uh, 6,500 6, people or so over the 10 years that we've been providing program, programming in various capacities. So there are a lot of people returning from our community. There are a lot of people, or to our community, a lot of people still struggling. And then you can look here through 2012, what's happened to the Dane County recidivism rate. You will see it up at that 66 in 2003. 2006 is when the journey home was implemented and the Dane County recidivism rate has come down to 2012, which is the last data that we, we've analyzed is about 12%. So these programs work. So, I like two minutes. She's so nice. <laughs> um, so we measure, as a United Way agency, we measure our outcomes. We measure how many people found jobs, how many people found housing. Housing is a huge barrier. Only about 37% of the people we work with who need housing have been able to find permanent housing. Um, our employment numbers are much better, 62% of the men and women we work with who needed and wanted employment have found employment. So successful reentry, I think it's important to remember too, uh, hits us financially. In 2014, Wisconsin spent $29,000 per year to incarcerate someone. If you multiply that by the 22,576 people we currently have in prison today, you can kind of start to see what we're spending to keep people in jail. And the research, again, shows that the more times someone goes into prison, the more likely they are to go back to prison when they come out. So we need programs when someone's coming out that first time, well, best to prevent them from going in in the first place. But that's probably a conversation on systemic change and policy that we could get into in another day. Um, we can save a lot of money. The journey home costs, the average cost per participant is $756 for a year of service in the journey home, compared to $29,000. So, and, and we don't do it all alone. Successful reentry doesn't happen in a vacuum. We have hundreds of community partners. I see Cheryl there. We've referred families to the Rainbow Project, to Porchlight. We've referred families for substance abuse treatment, to Journey Mental Health. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. And the National Institute of Corrections looked at what the cost was for wraparound reentry programming in the community, the national average. So take the Journey Home plus mental health plus maybe family counseling plus the average cost for a year in community-based, evidence-based practices is $11,150. So even if we spent that, we would be saving almost $18,000 a year per person that does not go back into our prison system. The Milwaukee Journal Sentinel looked at return to prison rates in Wisconsin, and they found that in 2013, almost 8,000 people were sent to prison. And more than half of those individuals were reincarcerated without a trial. They were reincarcerated for rule violations. So how do we address that? In summary, <laughs> you know, once a person leaves prison, we as a community have a decision to make. Are we going to invest in their successful reentry? Because when we invest in their reentry, we're helping them rebuild their life in a way that reunites and strengthens families that reduces the number of crime victims in our community, thereby reducing law enforcement and criminal justice system costs? Do we invest in them not just by supporting our human services safety net, but by opening doors of opportunity as landlords and employers? Because when we do that, we expand our tax base in our community. When we do that, those individuals become our customers. They become renters or homeowners. This is the investment the United Way has made in the journey home. It's the investment employers like Zimbrick has made. It's the reason we bought our journey, our, our Just Bakery delivery van from Zimbrick. You know, there's, that's a little quid pro quo, maybe. We want to support the businesses in our community 
that are offering those second chances. And so I just want to thank all of our partners in this work, and that includes the employers, it includes the landlords, it includes all the other agencies, and it includes funders like the United Way, who over a decade ago looked at what was happening and said, we can address this, and we can address it effectively. So I want to thank you again for inviting me today. Thank you so much, Linda. She will be around to take questions if you want to chat with her later. I'm going to grab my bell. Have a great day. This meeting is adjourned.